listening to Shout for Libraries in Edmonton on CJSR. We're a group of library students at the University of Alberta who are raising awareness about topics such as censorship, freedom of expression, and social responsibility. My name is Michelle. And I'm Corey. And we'll be your hosts for this half hour of library-centric radio. Thanks for tuning in. On each episode of Shout for Libraries, we explore a different issue in library and information studies. Today we'll be discussing privacy in the library. The Technology Analysis Division of the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada released a report last November in response to increased levels of awareness of the need for digital security and privacy, which has only become more of an issue since the news of the Cambridge Analytica data scandal on Facebook. The report suggests using privacy-enhancing technologies, or PETs, to manage online privacy and security risks for information in transit, which I love because now I get to imagine my cat fighting trolls. The first group of pets are called consent, and they force sites and programs to ask for user permission to use data in a variety of ways. This is the buddy who wants to make sure everyone is having a good time. The second group is data minimization, which only allows the smallest amount of data possible to be used for the purpose of the application which you're interacting with. They're the friend who is refusing to leave the room until you take your home address off of Facebook. Data tracking pets, which I'm going to call dogs, log, archive, and look up the information that you've already disclosed, telling you when, to whom, and under what circumstances you did so, basically making them your sober friend who has to remind you what you did last night. There's anonymity, which hides your online identity like it's your buddy with the fake IDs, and control, which lets you choose what information is sent where, standing in for your big friend who likes to hit the gym and glare at people. It also includes negotiate terms and conditions, a pet type being developed to move away from take-it-or-leave-it user conditions acting like your friend who thinks it's normal to try to haggle over prices at Walmart, teaming up with technical enforcement pets to well actually your way into enforcement of negotiated terms. Remote audit enforcement is your helpful stalker pal who will go through the garbage of online service providers and merchants until they figure out how well their terms and conditions are enforced. Finally, use of legal right pets are your friend who's been hearing what people have been saying about you and thinks you should probably do something about it, giving you the right to access information being held about you and challenge its accuracy. Unfortunately, most of these helpful buddies have yet to go mainstream, the main issues being lack of public awareness of them and the complexity and uncertainty surrounding privacy issues. Hopefully in this episode, we can do something about both of those. That sounds great. Thanks, Michelle. So for our first segment today, we're so happy to have Kendra Kelly with us in the studio here. Kendra is a Huko Sliss student and a valued member of our Shout for Libraries team. She's here today to talk, uh, talk to us about consent-based technology. Okay, so Kendra, you just got back from meetings in Toronto. Why were you there, and how does this relate to our theme of privacy? Yeah, so I'm fortunate enough to be part of a group called EFFECT, which stands for Experimental Feminist Ethical Collaboration Tools and Technologies. We're committed to disruptive ideation and messy collaboration, where we explore digital and computational literacy in environments that experience systemic and oppressive barriers to participation. On top of many of the different working projects, one is with METRAC, um, a Toronto-based organization pursuing liberation from violence for women and youth. So we are specifically working with their program called Respect in Action, or REACT, that mentors youth facilitators to deliver interactive and tech-related after-school programs, workshops, trainings, and presentations for youth, educators, and service providers, which is where my soon-to-be workshop around consent-based technology comes into play and connects with the theme of this episode. Cool. And can you tell us more about this connection? Sure. So... I believe that the majority of conversations we have around online privacy are actually in response to breaches of said privacy. For example, the sharing of data, um, Cambridge Analytica, identity theft, etc. So while it's important to respond to these breaches and protect ourselves from them in the future, I also think we need to move past privacy as a response um, to talking about consent as a way of engaging from the beginning. And how do we practice consent on the internet? First, I really want to shout out the work being done in Detroit, specifically through the Allied Media Project, and Toronto through Us Also Too. Us Also Too created a really incredible zine called Building Consentful Technology that has been instrumental to my work. 
This contributes to a larger conversation around consent. It looks specifically to extend the understanding from one that addresses physical consent. So, for example, uh, needing informed consent to perform a surgery on somebody, consensual sex, uh, to one that also accounts for our data, identities, and online interactions, or what we can call our digital bodies. By digital bodies, what I mean is pieces of personal data that, like our physical bodies, interact and exist in relationship with each other and can belong in community. They're also susceptible to harm and can be acted on in non-consensual ways. So, for example, Uber tracking our locations and travel times, private data being shared for ad purposes or election fraud. <laughs> Further, our digital bodies are, being, are so dispersed and can be accessed in so many different ways that our means of and ability to keep track of consent um, is obscured. And so what can we do about it? Yeah, so the idea behind consent-based technology is that it happens from the ground up. Coding needs to be a more representative of a complex world of tech users and creators, and B, conversations around consent need to be had before a single line of code is written. By designing systems so that certain things cannot or must occur, uh, we make harm less likely. Non-tech people can help build consent-based technologies by holding platforms accountable, advocating for consent elsewhere in their lives, and learning more about code policies and legislation. Can you give us an example? Definitely. So uh, encryption techniques, which allow our users' information to be stored fully on their device and not accessible to others, is a type of technology that's already being used to a certain degree. However, this can be really challenging on a large scale. But it does give us a way to start thinking about bottom-up security in tech. And Kendrick, can you tell us why this is important to you? While this conversation is essential to all tech users, it poses an important opportunity for youth, the target audience of our Metrack workshop, who are learning consent, sometimes for the first time, elsewhere in their lives and in the Metrack curriculum. If we can start talking about consent and technology from a young age, not only will we expand the understanding of consent as a fundamental relationship process, but also essential to safe and healthy technology. Additionally, while technology has the ability to bridge communities, aid healing processes, and mobilize resistance, it also has the potential to be used to dangerous and oppressive means. Algorithms are used to determine rates of recidivism of potential criminals based on who they are related to and what neighborhoods they live in. Facial recognition software is being used by policing bodies to identify and profile potential minor offenders, and mortgage approval is being determined by algorithms. All of these systems have built-in racial and class bias, something that starts with the very code in which they're written. We need to start talking about algorithmic justice and consent because our real lives and online worlds are being made more and more connected without our consent. Thank you so much, Kendra, for coming down here and talking to us today. Thanks for having me. All right. Next up, we have Rachel Oselin, who will be talking to us about how libraries advocate and educate about digital privacy. Hello, my name is Rachel Oselin, and I'm going to talk to you today about how libraries advocate and educate about digital privacy. Let's start with the American Library Association, or ALA. The ALA takes, place, takes privacy seriously. As stated on their website, the right to privacy, the right to read, consider, and develop ideas and beliefs free from observation and unwanted surveillance by the government or others is the bedrock foundation for intellectual freedom. It is the essential to the exercise of free speech, free thought, and free association. So why is privacy so important? ALA states, privacy is essential to free inquiry in the library because it enables library users to select, access, and consider information and ideas without fear or an embarrassment, judgment, punishment, or ostracism. The ALA further states, librarians, libraries, and library workers have an ethical obligation to preserve users' right to privacy and prevent any unauthorized use or discourse of users' personally identify information and data associated with their use of the library's resources. So now they've drafted and collected a series of resources to help librarians and libraries have up-to-date policies and educational resources. They created a privacy toolkit and a Q&A about privacy and the library. This toolkit is designed to help librarians create privacy policies and educational resources for their patrons. As they state on their website, technology is a blessing and a curse. It's provided opportunities like user-created contact and interactivity. 
Library users are now not only consuming information, they are creating it. The current issues and threats, potential solutions, and resources can be found in the Privacy Toolkit. In the last decade, challenges to privacy from a multitude of sources have been on the rise. Consequently, questions about privacy in libraries are escalating. The Q&A has been created to provide additional guidance for librarians struggling with privacy issues. In 2016, they drafted the Library Privacy Guidelines. The Intellectual Freedom Committee approved several new privacy guidelines intended to assist librarians, libraries, schools, and vendors to develop best practices for online privacy and data management and security. And in 2017, they put together the Library Privacy Checklist to provide libraries of all types with practical guidance on implementing the library privacy guidelines. Now that we have a bit of background on privacy advocacy in the library, what are Canadian libraries doing to educate their patrons about digital privacy? Most library websites have a standard privacy policy in terms of use, but others have gone the extra mile to educate the public and their patrons. I will now take you through three examples of libraries that have gone the extra mile to educate their patrons about digital privacy. First off, the Vancouver Public Library, or VPL, has a selection on their website called Digital Awareness, which includes a list of resources that teach you about digital privacy, including how to avoid identity theft and how to use social media responsibly. They also give a list of recommended books to read and useful websites to visit to teach you more about your digital privacy. As stated on their site, Digital awareness includes understanding your online identity, protecting your online privacy, increasing your computer security, using social networking wisely, and protecting your digital assets. The information found on these resources is geared toward educating the public about their digital privacy as it applies to the user's online presence. Now, if you wanted to learn about the library's privacy policies and terms of use for their website and catalog, both can easily be found on the policy page of their website. Now, next up is the Toronto Public Library, or TPL, who have chosen to do things a bit differently. They also have a policy page for privacy called Access to Information and Protection of Privacy, as well as a page about the library's website policies called Online Privacy and Access to Information. They go a step further than VPL and include a page called Digital Content and Your Privacy that includes privacy in terms of use information about all the online resources that TPL uses. Now this page is designed to help users understand that when they leave the library website to use an online resource, such as Hoopla, that resource is governed by its own policies and terms of use. Now in 2016, TPL launched their Digital Privacy Initiative that is spearheaded by Jonathan Hodge, a librarian at TPL. Now, this is to foster debate and awareness about digital privacy. The goal of this initiative is to educate, to advocate, and to agitate for privacy to be the central part of everyone's lives as well as online. On November 10th, 2016, they hosted a conference with speakers from Citizen Lab, the Monk School of U of T, Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and the Library Freedom Project, where they address aspects of privacy and digital security. This conference can be found on YouTube under the title Digital Privacy Project Launch 2016. Now, they also started public classes that are six hours each for over four weeks and the piloted in eight locations, which saw over 100 participants. These classes are designed to teach users the best practices, habits, tips, and technologies to secure their personal information and reclaim their privacy rights on the internet. Now here in Alberta, the Edmonton Public Library, or EPL, has a section on their website dedicated to educating users about digital privacy called Digital Privacy and EPL. The link can be found at the bottom of any page on the EPL website. Here, users can learn about how information is used and shared on EPL's website and with the library's online resources. There are even sections on how to update and manage your privacy settings for your online account through EPL. 
These are just three examples of how Canadian libraries are working to educate the public on digital privacy. I hope this has inspired you to check out what your library is doing for digital privacy advocacy and awareness. This has been Rachel Oslin for Shout for Libraries. Thank you, Rachel. Finally, we have Chris Joseph, who will be helping us get our cybersecurity on. This is Chris Joseph. I'm a student in the School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Alberta, and I am sitting here with a very special guest. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Quincy. I'm also a master's student. <laughs> and we are going to be talking today about uh, a workshop that uh, we have been doing with the uh, Future Librarians for Intellectual Freedom on the topic of privacy. And I thought, Quincy, maybe you could just tell our listeners what the workshop is. Okay, so just some background. So I am part of FLIF, which is uh, Future Librarians for Intellectual Freedom, and Chris uh, pitched to Fliff that we would do this workshop. And so I signed on kind of as a volunteer to help run uh, the breakout sessions. And that's what the whole idea of this workshop is. It's not just a lecture. It is, you know, it's, it's an experience to take people who may feel that they're not privacy literate or that they don't know anything or they might know something and just want to know more and get them to that point where they're feeling really comfortable with not only the online tools that they're using, but all of their interactions online. So we cover some basic privacy awareness. So, you know, who is out there looking for your data? Uh, what's being collected either with your knowledge or without your knowledge, uh, what that information may look like. And then we kind of talk through a lot of ways that you can kind of like see, do a little privacy self-assessment. You say, okay, so what has been, what has been collected about me? Did I know about this? Am I okay about this? And then we start to talk about, you know, it's okay. It's going to look scary at first. <laughs> and then we start talking through a lot of tools that we can say, okay, now you can take control of your own privacy in this way. Uh, so we talk through device encryption. We talk through password management and password creation. And we talk through not just how to do that yourself, but also the kind of the concepts and theories. We also talk about tracking, how you can disable trackers online or how you can use browsers that are committed to not tracking you. What is the privacy self-assessment? Because this is something people can actually do, right? Exactly. So the privacy self-assessment, I think we have a series of four different methods that one can start to look at. So the first one is just Googling yourself or doxing, as we call it. And that's just typing your name first and last as you spell it into Google and hit search <laughs> or your search engine of choice. Of course, Google will probably have the most interesting results. And that comes up with a lot of interesting things. Uh, for example, myself, my name is Quincy. There's not many Quincy's in the world, and there's not many female Quincy's especially. And especially my first and last name is, is quite unique. So the first five pages of a Google search uh, are automatically hits about me. It's an eye-opening experience. And I know like the last workshop we did, uh, we used my name. I had mentioned when I started this when I started volunteering to help with these workshops, I did go through all these steps for myself. And I found that there were a lot of things out there that I didn't know <laughs> were out there. Uh, for example, so in, in my undergraduate degree, I'm a musician, and so I did a music undergrad, and I did a graduation recital. And that was taped and recorded and put on YouTube for my family and friends who couldn't physically be there. It was supposed to be private, and then when I when I first Googled myself, you know, three years later now, all of a sudden I started seeing that graduation recital video everywhere. It wasn't just on YouTube. A lot of third-party websites had taken it. And, and that's an instance where it's pretty innocent. I'm a musician. I'm a performer. I record my works to be out there. But just to see websites in different countries and events in different countries that I had had no knowledge of at all, that my information was just there, <laughs> was a very weird experience. So what did you actually do in response to finding that video? One of the things we recommend is contacting whoever on every website, there's going to be a contact somewhere. And you can say, hey, I did not give you permission to host my information. Please take it down. And I've done that a total of five times now, and I've had five success successful stories. So that's really great. But I think I think when we when we told that story, there were a lot of people who you could kind of see like it click in their in their heads. They're like, "Oh yeah, even if it's okay, that's an instance where it wasn't something that's harmful. But what if it is?" Yeah, because I, I mean it, it's so subjective and personal. I mean the the act of googling yourself is about going, "Okay, where do I appear?" They're going to pop up somewhere, but you have to be able to look at those results and go, "Okay, so this is here." Am I okay with that or not? Which is an individual decision. And then you have to decide from there what you're willing to do about it. Yeah, Exactly. And I think that's kind of our overarching theme of the entire workshop is like just awareness 
of what can be collected and then a toolkit for dealing with that and for taking more control. So our kind of our second step that we do is the have I been pwned? So PWN. I'm all, we'll put a link up. And basically you can just put your emails that you've used in your life in there and you can see if that email, like that company has ever been breached in since you've had that email. Most people, so it can be really scary, you put your email in and then you click enter and all of a sudden a giant red screen comes up and you're like, oh my goodness, everything's been compromised. That's not quite true. As we talk about, it's pretty unlikely. I think it's if you've had an email for longer than 10 years that you would come up in the green. Uh, so that would be you, you've never experienced a, da a data breach. Uh, we talk about, okay, like let's, now let's, what do you do with this information? You look through this list and you're like, okay, LinkedIn had a leak in 2015. I've changed my password since then. Great. Adobe had a, a leak in 2013. So, okay, have I, have I changed my password? And this is where you start to think like, okay, if you haven't, then that password associated with that uh, email that you signed up for with that company is now out there. Probably a good time to change it. But again, just like that first step, the cool thing about using a tool like that and thinking about it in that context is that it's not, it's not meant to, to freak you out mm -hmm. so much as it is to go, okay, this is information. You still have control and some authority over what happens as a result of that information. Exactly. It's very empowering. At least that's a uh, that's a cycle I go through every time we give this workshop. I'm always, I do still feel very overwhelmed when we start talking about it. And then kind of as we go through it, be like, okay, I've done this. I've taken some control back. And then we go kind of into tools that can help you enhance what you already have and kind of assess what, what the different privacy measures your browser has enabled. So that's in Panopticlick. Highly recommend that you do this test with yourself. So you basically just go to Panopticlick, you click run a test, and it says, okay, you know, has your browser met these uh, these measures, yes or no? It basically tells you, like, what your browser is and is not doing. So is it blocking anything that's trying to track you? Is it sifting through anything that's trying to track you? But what's really nice is we, you know, at the beginning of the workshop, we say, okay, like, try Panopticlick. How's your browser doing? You're probably going to have a lot of X's. But then as we go through the workshop and as we go through our sessions, at the end, you're probably going to have a lot more check marks. Once you've done all this, like, that still doesn't fix everything. <laughs> There's still a lot of public facing information on your social media accounts or any kind of online account that you may not know is actually showing that. So I know one of the notorious ones is LinkedIn this last summer changed a lot of settings. And I've heard that they're changing something again pretty soon. Just go in and see, and it, it, they will tell you in your settings. And sometimes it might just say settings, it say it might say privacy settings, it might say security settings, and just see like what is what is toggled to be public facing, whether you know someone has an account or not. Can someone just migrate to your your whole homepage from the internet and see all of that information? See a picture of you, see your resume, see you know, where you live. Sometimes they can, they'll even show um, email addresses and phone numbers. So you really got to be aware. You mentioned Facebook really briefly as well. And in light of all the Cambridge Analytica stuff, I think Facebook just this week or last week has mm -hmm. done a bunch of changes to their privacy settings. So yes. that's another place people should be really go in and check and make sure that things are reflecting their values. Exactly. These things do change. And they, sometimes they will change with very little ripples <laughs> and very and no heads up to anyone. And maybe that's something as a society as we go forth to, to demand from our online tools and online account. Check every six months. You know, check every three months. If you're really paranoid, check every week. <laughs> it's like spring cleaning, like once a year. Yeah. Just do it. Put it on the calendar and do like your not your June social media audit. <laughs> exactly. And that's something I really appreciate about this workshop as well is, you know, we really encourage, like, if you don't need that account anymore, you haven't used it in three years, you know, if you haven't used that email address in 10 years, like, get rid of it. Delete it. There are ways to do that. So now that we've done the assessment, I think what probably we'll do is we'll put some links in the show notes mm -hmm. uh, to the tools and uh, some links and the guide that we use for the workshop so people can have a look and they can do the assessment for themselves and then they can act on it. But you've been teaching the workshop basically all year for the mm -hmm. times that we've done it on campus and out in the Leduc at the public library there. I was wondering if you could just tell me what has surprised you about teaching this workshop to people. I think what continually surprises me is certain, you, there is no demographic for privacy literacy. There is no like one demographic that's going to be better than the others. It, it doesn't have anything to do with how technically proficient you are. So just because you have, I don't know, even if you've like built Linux for yourself, that doesn't mean that you're an expert on privacy. And so there's kind of this assumption that once you're, once you know how to use a computer and you've got a few, you've had a few cell phones, you've, you have a tablet that, that you understand. 
And so uh, you mentioned Leduc. Like, I think that that was one of the most fascinating uh, experiences was I think we, everyone, all of us who give the workshop had to, like, scrub some biases out of our, out of our heads because the, the demographic there was largely older and, you know, not with super heavy tech. <laughs> I think one, one of them came up in with a flip phone. Uh, but yeah, they're generally not people who were really engaging with the online environment, but they were very wary of it. And so they actually passed a lot of the tests in the self-assessment because they were already really not just wary, but also just careful of, of about the and conscious of the information that they were putting online. Do you have an example of uh, somebody in the workshop who talked about her own level of consciousness about where she shares information? Yes, uh, yes. And actually, uh, as I got to talk to her, um, her she was a bank employee. Oh. <laughs> so I think that's why she was so conscious about privacy. But uh, she actually um, had a whole spiel about why she's never put anything in an online bank- banking environment. She's really not comfortable with that. So she had a lot of questions about kind of security. It's just very interesting to hear people talk about that and and give their experience. None of them had Facebook, and it was because they, since Facebook came out, they just had this inherent distrust of putting that much information online, and I think they've all been proven absolutely right. (laughs) In your dream view, what does this workshop look like, and who has access to it? Like, where where do you want to see it go? Well, what I really like about this workshop and something that I really appreciated through working with you, Chris, is you've always been, you know, it, it is under a Creative Commons license, share and share alike, non-commercial, I mm-hmm. believe. So, you know, w- we've put this together and we do this to get it out there and we want it to grow. I mean, ideally, it would be a day-long workshop, yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not going to happen. And so I think what we've been able to come up with in the three-hour format works really well. You know, it's just getting the word out there. And we have that 150-page mega guide (laughs) that actually is surprisingly readable um, and very informative. And I've gone through that with my husband. I've gone through that with my grandparents. I'm trying to get my parents on board. We'll see what happens. (laughs) I think that's just a testament to how usable both the workshop and the documentation that we've come up with is. Well, um, thanks so much for chatting with me about this today. And thanks so much for helping teach what has been a very unruly and um, interesting (laughs) workshop experiment for for Fliff and for Sliz. Yeah, I think it's actually been one of my favorite things that I've ever done in my academic career. And I really hope to continue uh, contributing to these workshops even after I graduate. Awesome. Thanks, Quincy. Thank you, Chris. If you're just tuning in, this is Shout for Libraries on CJSR, and that's it for today's show. A special thanks to Anoop Hadihan, a.k.a. Anoop Scoop, who composed our theme music. We hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you to our guests for joining us on Shout for Libraries. You can visit our Facebook page at Shout for Libraries, or visit us on Twitter at Shout, the number four, Libraries. Once again, this has been Michelle and Corey. And we have been your hosts for this half hour of library-centric radio. Catch us on the next episode of Shout for Libraries.